It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is for the Premier. In the Premier's briefing on the NAFTA renegotiation yesterday, was he updated on the status of the U.S. steel and aluminum tariffs that are still being applied to Canadian goods? Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker, before I answer the, the question of the Leader of Opposition, uh, first, uh, I want to congratulate, congratulate Dr. Donna Strickland. Dr. Donna Strickland has just been awarded the 2018 Nobel Priest, uh, Prize for Physics. That's, a, that's, a, that's absolutely huge. For you, Mr. Speaker, she's the first Canadian woman ever to receive this award and the first woman in 55 years. She teaches at the University of Waterloo, and she's from Guelph, Ontario. So, Dr. Donna Strickland, congratulations. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Speaker, we want to make sure the world knows that Ontario is open for business. That's why. That is why our government, the PC government, stood shoulder to shoulder with the federal government when it came to negotiations. We're calling on the Trudeau government to use federal funds to compensate on Ontario dairy farmers. We need to support our dairy farmers. We need to support our farmers, our steel and aluminum workers, and to make sure they aren't being used as bargaining chips. I'm asking the Leader of the Opposition and her caucus to stand with us as we stood side by side with the federal government, stand with us to support Response. the farmers, the steel workers, the aluminum workers, to make sure they are compensated by the Trudeau government. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary. Tariffs have been in place since June, and they're having a devastating effect not just on the steel industry, but on the entire manufacturing sector, Speaker, and the people who rely on that sector for good jobs. They're worried about the future. Across the border in Quebec, the provincial government didn't delay. They stepped up in June with direct fin financial aid to companies affected by the tariffs. When will the Premier take similar action here? Speaker? Here. Through you, Mr. Speaker, our number one priority was to make sure we got the deal done. That was critical, and I congratulate the federal government for getting the job done. But keep in mind, nearly 9 million Americans' jobs depend on the Canadian, here, here. Canadian and U.S. trade uh, investments. But even more importantly, there's $389 billion of trade going back and forth just between Ontario and the U.S., split almost equally. There is a billion jobs, a, bi a million jobs, I wish there was a billion jobs, a million jobs at stake right here in Ontario. And again, again, I'm asking the Leader of the Opposition in the caucus, the whole NDP caucus, Spons. to stand with us. Support the farmers, support the aluminum and steel workers, and we can support them. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, people worried about losing their shift or losing a job don't want to hear politicians passing the buck when their jobs are at risk right. and they're worried about the future. In the province of Quebec, the government stepped up. They stepped up with direct fi financial aid, money for training, for steel, for aluminum, and for the agricultural sector. So my question to our Premier in this province is, is this Premier willing to step up with provincial assistance? Through you, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition, we're still waiting for the federal government to give us some numbers. We're going to be meeting with the agriculture industry this afternoon, looking forward to speaking to them, and then later on we're in the week we're going to be meeting the steel and aluminum industry. 
I asked the Prime Minister directly yesterday on the phone, where's the money? Yeah. Where's the money we're waiting for to support the steel and aluminum workers? And I didn't get a straight answer. I'm looking forward to that straight answer. But I can assure all the agriculture industry, I can assure the steel and aluminum workers that we're standing behind them, unlike the NDP that I didn't see one of them stand up yeah. to support any of those industries, I will assure that they will have a close ally and a friend with a PC government. Order. Start the clock. Next question. Well, it's not so, but nonetheless, uh, Speaker, the uh, truth is that in Quebec they had a premier that did step up, didn't wait around, stepped up and tried to help those industries and those workers. My next question is also to the premier, though, Speaker, because we are joined today by farmers Order from on the government Ontario. Side here in our legislature and for those farmers who have relied on supply management to ensure they can earn a living and pay the bills while they do the hard work of feeding our families, the renegotiated NAFTA is devastating news. What details does the Premier have about the federal compensation that will be offered? Here. Through you, Mr. Speaker, again, if the Leader of the Opposition actually stood shoulder to shoulder with the PC government, as we did yep. with the Liberal government, we might be able to work a lot better. Yeah. We, we need to stand as a united team here in Ontario. We need to have a united voice for all the dairy and aluminum and steel workers. We need to protect the jobs, though close to the million jobs that all these industries create day in and day out again. I'm asking the NDP to put their partisanship to the side just once, just once, and stand with us. Yep. And as for the Premier of Quebec, I spoke to the new Premier of Quebec last night. What a great job. What a great job he's going to do, and he's looking forward to working with Ontario because he's fiscally responsible, here, here. just like the Thank you. Stop the clock. And start the clock again. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the fact is that many farm families believe that the federal compensation won't be enough, and they're asking serious questions, Speaker, serious questions about whether they can keep going as the system that made their farm sustainable is chipped away. Is the Premier prepared to provide additional assistance and programs from the province to ensure that farms are sustainable in the long term? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition, right, it never ends. Fear mongering. The Leader of the Opposition doesn't have a clue what it is because she doesn't know. I don't know because it wasn't told to us yesterday when we were on the call. Matter of fact, no province knows what they have in hand. But I can reassure again the farmers, you have an ally. You have a friend. We look forward to sitting down with you this afternoon. But once we do find out that number, I can assure you we're going to support them like they've never seen before. Start the clock again. Final supplementary. Sure, they're a little bit concerned, Speaker, seeing how, seeing as how the government didn't step up to help the steel and aluminum uh, industries, but farm families are wondering, wondering whether they should actually continue in farming or pack it in. People are looking for solutions, not politicians passing the buck back and forth across uh, the table. This is a chance for the Premier to show leadership in the job that he actually holds not waiting for the federal government, but show some leadership in the job that he holds. In other provinces, provincial Order. leaders have stepped up to the plate. Will we see that leadership from this Premier? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I find it so ironic listening to the Leader to the Opposition when I was in Hamilton over at the FASCO, right down the street where the Leader lives, 
I heard how we helped them. We got rid of the cap and trade and the carbon tax. We talked to their employers. They said they haven't seen hide their hair, the leader of the opposition. We're lowering their hydro rates. We're lowering the gas prices by 10 cents a litre. I spoke to the frontline workers, and they loved it that I showed up. Maybe the leader of the opposition should pay him a visit once in a while in her own backyard. Yes, Uh, once again, I'm going to remind the House that uh, personal attacks of any sort do not uh, elevate the debate. Um, next question. Leader of the Opposition, start the clock. Next question is also for the Premier. The opioid crisis is killing people on a daily basis. Families with loved ones caught in addiction know that overdose prevention sites save lives. The Minister of Health had promised that the Premier would make a decision about proceeding with overdose prevention sites by the end of last week. Instead, we see more delay and more excuses and, tragically, more preventable deaths. When will this Premier stop dithering and make a decision? Premier. Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. I appreciate the question from the member opposite. Uh, but let me be perfectly clear. The Minister of Health has received an extension on three pause sites. They received that extension from the federal government. But this government, and I want to be very clear, we are committed to getting people struggling with addiction the help that they need. That's why this government will be making an unprecedented 3.8 billion dollar investment into mental health and addictions and supportive housing. And anybody that's followed this, this party in the last several years knows that we have been a leader uh, in the fight against opioids in this province, calling for a task force that the previous government took nine months. If you want to talk about delay, it was the previous Liberal administration that didn't get the job done. We were leaders on banning the pill press, and that's something that we've talked about. We've talked about Nick's law, making sure that there's more uh, awareness and greater advertising against the opioid crisis. So I'll stand here on behalf of the Minister of Health and tell them that we're ready and committed to doing the Start the clock. Next question, or rather, uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, what the minister failed to um, talk about is the $330 million cut in mental health and addictions finances. And Look, every single day that this, this decision is delayed, it means more people are dying. And when people are no longer alive, they cannot seek treatment, Speaker. The evidence is overwhelming. These sites are saving lives. What evidence is the Premier waiting for? Minister. Well, I entirely reject the premise of the leader of the official opposition's question. This government is going to bring in an unprecedented level of funding for mental health, addictions, and supportive housing to the tune of $3.8 billion. That's unmistakable. It's undeniable. We have said we are committed to reviewing the latest data, the evidence, and current drug injection sites. Both myself and the Minister of Health have been consistently meeting and touring across the province to those who are affected. But I say again, Speaker, we have hit the pause button on three injection sites. The federal government has allowed that extension, and we are committed on this side of the House and, by the way, on that side of the House in ensuring that we have the proper Her. support for those people who are struggling with mental health and addictions, including in the open water. Crisis, and come to order. They can squeal with righteous self determination all they want. We're going to act. Yeah. Next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox, and Addington. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation, and Trade. Yesterday, the United States, Canada, and Mexico agreed to a new trade agreement called the USMCA. The new agreement included major, major concessions from Canada's agricultural industry on Class 7 milk, increased access to Ontario's dairy, chicken, and egg market. Well, one thing's clear, Mr. Speaker, Ontario's dairy, chicken, and egg farmers are the ones that are on the hook 
for this federal government's negotiation position. So can the minister please inform this legislature today of what our government for the people is doing to stand up for this very, very critical part of Ontario's agricultural industry? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. To my honourable colleague for the, uh, for the question. Uh, for months now, Ontario has been working with the federal government, uh, going down to Washington and standing up for Ontario workers, Ontario farmers, steel workers, aluminum workers. And we were disappointed yesterday that the federal government, everyone's known that dairy's been on the table for a while, didn't have any details of a compensation package ready. Uh, it was unacceptable, as one of my colleagues just said. It was shocking. And it's also shocking that they left the steel and aluminum tariffs on the table, Mr. Speaker, because while they might have a new NAFTA here, the U.S. still has the ability to put tariffs on anything they want in the future, therefore making the new NAFTA practically useless. Yeah. So it's steel and aluminum today. It could be something else in the future, depending on what the flavor of the month is down there. So we call upon the federal government to come forward immediately with the details and the compensation to our dairy industry. We need to make dairy, poultry and eggs whole again. We need to save the 3,600 family farms that are active in the dairy industry in Ontario, and that's what we're going to do, Mr. Speaker. We're going to stand up for Ontario farmers. Supplementary, start the clock. Mr. Thank you so kind of your response and your affirmative action on this file. It's a relief to hear that really our government continues to do its part to defend this important part of agricultural community and, and the many, many families that depend on this. This is just not an industry. This is a group of families across mm -hmm. this province. And, and we're aware, of course, as well as the minister testified at the U.S. Department of Commerce public hearings on Section 32, which is the investigation of imports on autos and auto parts. And despite reaching an agreement in principle the other day, Discussions around steel and aluminum have been inconclusive. We have heard that. 25% tariffs on steel and 10% tariffs on aluminum still remain in place. So could the minister please inform this legislature of our government's position on these tariffs that continue to actually penalize Ontario's industry? Thank you, thank you uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you again to my, my colleague for an excellent question. Uh, as I said uh, in the first part of my answer, uh, while the threat of tariffs remains, uh, NAFTA, you can, you can drive a Mack truck through it. Um, you know, they solved for a time being the threat of auto tariffs and auto parts tariffs, and then they say to us on the phone, the Premier, yesterday, that 232, Section 332 tariffs on aluminum, steel, and God knows what else in the future uh, are separate issues. Well, they're not separate issues. The technical briefing then at 1 o'clock said they had tried to discuss that at the table but were rejected. The U.S. didn't want to. They want to keep hanging this over our heads. Well, if they keep hanging this over our heads, thousands and thousands of people on this side of the border will be affected. Their jobs could be affected, and millions on the other side of the border. And so we're asking the NDP today to stand with us, to stop putting down the police and stand up for workers. To stop. Once again, once again, I'll remind members that these kinds of personal attacks lead to uh, degen a degeneration of the debate. We don't want to go there like we did last week. House will come to order. 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 Start the clock. Next question. Member for Tomiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. All farmers are impacted by trade deals. The new NAFTA agreement will have a major impact on dairy and poultry sectors and everyone else involved in the industry, including processors. And agriculture it was signed by the federal government but agriculture is one of the sectors that has federal provincial responsibility. Under the deal for dairy, class seven of milk was eliminated. The classes are regulated provincially under the Milk Act. That's not a federal issue. 
and the elimination of Class 7 could have a much bigger destabilizing impact than the loss of market access, which should be compensated. But the, the, the destabilization will have, could permanently damage supply management. What is the provincial government going to do to stabilize the industry because of the elimination of Class 7, which is a provincial responsibility? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. I know many Ontarians, including our agriculture communities, are concerned about what the new USMCA deal could mean for industries that rely on trade. We're still reviewing what the impact of these changes will be, including the Class 7. However, it's clear that the concessions made in the new agreement will hurt our supply managed sector, particularly the dairy. We have reached out to our stakeholders and are committed to continue to work with them as we determine the details of the impact of this new deal. We're calling on the Trudeau government to use federal funds to compensate dairy farmers. This new deal cannot leave our farmers behind. Farming jobs and farming families must never be used as bargaining chips. From day one, we have offered full support for our farmers. Our Premier and our Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade traveled to Washington to raise the concerns and make sure our farmers are top of mind. We will continue to stand by. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. The long term stability of our dairy farm families relies on the stability of our milk classification process. The elimination of Class 7 destabilizes that process. The, cla the, the classification system is a provincial responsibility. This isn't about federal compensation, which is a totally separate issue. This is about the provincial responsibility to maintain the stability of the system on which farmers and Ontario consumers and Canadian consumers have relied on for over 50 years. Again, to the minister, what action is the government going to take to stabilize the milk classes so supply management can continue to exist? Thank you, Speaker. Minister. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank the member for the question. And as, as I said, we are continuing to review the impact of this new deal in its entirety and its impact on our dairy industry. That includes Class 7. The, the issues in that deal uh, are negotiated by the federal government, and the responsibility to look after that is the responsibility of the federal government. And so that's why we need to make sure we review the, the process and then make sure the federal government deals with the financial assistance to our farmers in a way that deals with all the impacts they have created Order. through this negotiation. Next question, the member from Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Yesterday, an article in the Toronto Sun reported that over the last five years, gun violence and murders have spiked across the greater Toronto area. The article stated that shootings are up more than 130% from just a few years ago, and with three months remaining in 2018, the city is expected to smash its all-time record high of 89 homicides set back in 1991. The article also found that not since 2007 has Toronto seen so many killings in a single year. Mr. Speaker, the people of my riding and all throughout the GTA are understandably concerned about the levels of violence experienced in our city this year. Question. Could the minister please share with us the work this government is currently doing to stop gun violence in Toronto? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Mississauga East Cooksville for that.
thoughtful question. Uh, no one should have to live in fear of gun violence, and our hearts go out to the many people across the city and this province who have been affected by violent gun crime, which is why in August our government announced that it is taking action to protect families by investing $25 million in new funding over here, four here. years in initiatives aimed at fighting gang and gun violence. This includes investing over $7 million over the next four years in a brand new intensive firearm bail support team which will support existing justice resources. The team will consist of five crowns and five case management coordinators who will work with police to develop local expertise and compile information to ensure that the strongest possible evidence is placed before the courts when the Crown is seeking detention for serious firearm charges. Having Response. dedicated Crowns to focus on firearm bails will help people, keep people who present a danger to the public off our streets. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to report that as of yesterday, the team is up and running. Good. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Attorney General for that update. I agree that it's important that people feel safe in their communities, and I'm glad that our government is taking action to ensure that is the case. There have been too many tragic headlines over the past year, and I look forward to the success of this initiative, as well as all efforts aimed at curbing gun violence. Mr. Speaker, the Attorney General has given us good news with the announcement that our legal SWAT teams are now in place, and I'm hoping that she can provide further information on how they will assist in keeping violence off our streets. Thank you. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy to provide further information to the member and to his constituents. On August 4th, I stood with the Premier and the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services to announce this initiative. And yesterday, I met with the team, and I can tell you that they're enthusiastic about getting to work and putting a dent in gun violence experienced in this city this year. It was our aim to have this team up and running in six to eight weeks. And Mr. Speaker, yesterday was their first day on the job. They are stationed at courthouses across the city and moving where they need to go on a daily basis. They're working with the police to ensure that the best possible evidence is before the court during a bail hearing. It's an innovative approach that will deliver real results to tackle gun crime Good in stuff. the city of Toronto. Right Thank you. Next question, the member for Toronto, Dan Ford. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of the Environment. Ontario is facing potential for many billions of dollars of damages and potential loss of life from climate change-related extreme weather events in the years to come. Cap and trade funds were raised to reduce emissions from greenhouse sources. The projects were meant to help protect Order. Ontarians for the future. But when the government wound down cap and trade, they cancelled many initiatives that would have helped reduce emissions, including hundreds of millions of dollars for hospital, school, and social housing upgrades. It was not necessary to cancel those initiatives. So, can the government inform the House as to what they will be using the cap and trade funds for, if not for reducing emissions? Mr. The Environment, Conservation, and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, and thank you for the uh, thank him for the question. Um, he's quite right that this this government did make a clear commitment in the election that it would wind down the cap and trade program. One of the first actions of this government was to do that, and as a result, we're putting $260 back in the pockets of Ontario families. He, he raises the question about cap-and-trade funds. Some of the cap-and-trade funds that were going to be spent, for example, were on an electric truck company that's backed by Warren Buffett and Chinese billionaires. We decided those weren't good things to spend money on that Ontario taxpayers were subsidizing. The monies that have been raised have been raised under a charge uh, that was appropriately for uh, greenhouse gas reduction. The funds that were raised for that will be used either to fight greenhouse gas reductions or for the wind-down of that fund, as I've said before. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The minister says the funds meant to be spent to reduce emissions will be spent for that purpose. That's what he says. Then why did the government cut funding for schools and hospitals when those projects would have cut emissions? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, I don't 
know entirely what funds the member's talking about, but let's tell what, what we did, which was responsible. The responsible, the responsible thing to do, Mr. Speaker, when we cancelled the cap-and-trade program because it was ineffective, was to cut the, the funding, remove the dollars that were being spent that were raised by that order. program. It was the only responsible thing the Member government Member for Waterloo, come to order. The Premier, come to order. The only responsible thing that the government could do at the end of that program Here come to order. committed to the orderly wind down of the cap and trade program. And this fall, we'll talk about a made in Ontario solution, here, here. a solution that doesn't take money out of Ontarians' pockets but reduces greenhouse gases. Here, 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 here. Next question, the member for Don Valley East. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Bill 148 brought in fair and important changes to the Employment Standards Act for workers in this province. Mr. Government side, come to order. Mr. Speaker, I think it's reasonable that workers be given fair notice or compensation when their employer cancels their shift. It allows employees to have some stability in their schedule if they're going to school, if they're ensuring that they to ensure that they have adequate childcare, and if they're working a second job. But, Mr. Speaker, we've heard from the Premier, or we've heard from this government, that they're considering rolling back these changes in addition to cancelling a $15 minimum wage. Does the Premier believe that it's fair that work can be done and work can be cancelled only hours before a shift with no compensation? And my question to the speaker, my question through you, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier: Will he commit today to not rolling back this important aspect within the legislation? Premier. Um, through, through you, Mr. Speaker. When I traveled across this province and talked to thousands and thousands of people, I found out very, very quickly the number one issue was high road. Number two was Bill 148, that your party destroyed this province and put us in more debt than we've ever had the largest subnational debt in the entire world. The entire world thanks to the Liberal government. We're going to make sure we tell the world Ontario is open for business. We're going to make sure we're competitive around the world. We're getting rid of Bill 148. We're going to make sure we protect the frontline workers because 60,000 people lost their jobs under Bill 148. Supplementary. So there's going to be certain aspects that we disagree with 148, certain aspects of the bill. But let's let me try another point to this side. question, Mr. Speaker. Premier. I hesitate to interrupt the member. The government side has to come to order. The member has a right to place his question. Again, I apologize to the member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I'm going to ask a very simple question to the Premier. 1.6 million Ontarians do not have sick days. In the legislation, it guarantees two days to Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, this is not about this is this is about decency for employees, employees that work hard to support support businesses here in the province of Ontario. And I think when we when those people go out, that 1.6 million Ontarians go out and support businesses, the businesses should support the people that support those businesses. Does the premier believe that two sick days is too much? for people in Ontario. He says he stands up for the little guy. He says he stands up for the people of Ontario. Two sick days is decency, Mr. Speaker. Premier. Through, through, <laughs> through, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the member of Don Valley East. Again, when I crisscross this province and I talk to the people that earn minimum wage, the ones that even were able to keep their job. I'd go into a little home hardware. Rather than having seven employees, they cut three employees because of Bill 148. And the, peop and the people on minimum wage, we're actually going to give them a tax credit. Unlike the Liberals that jacked their taxes up over $1,000, we're going to reduce their taxes by $850, putting more money into their pocket. That's what you call tax relief. That's what you call supporting minimum wage workers. And we're going to create more jobs until we can hire more people, unlike the Liberals that destroyed this province. Next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Mr. Speaker, with a nod to the member from Nipissing, my question is to the Minister of Many Things, including 
Children, Community and Social Services. More than 34,000 illegal border crossers have entered our country since 2017, overloading our housing and social assistance systems, so much so that the federal government is forced to put them in hotels across the GTA. Today, we learned that their stay is being extended by four weeks while they wait for their asylum claims to be heard. Meanwhile, the federal minister responsible has tried to tell us that the overwhelming majority have left Canada. Pure fiction. Costs are piling up. Would the minister please tell us how Ontario will handle the growing financial burden to services such as education, legal aid, social assistance, and emergency shelter? Order. Start the clock. Response, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Speaker, my, uh, my greatest appreciation to the member opposite who I've been speaking with on immigration and refugee issues uh, for the past week. I want to be very clear, and I hope the federal Liberals are listening, that the federal government has sole jurisdiction over border management in this country uh, on Canada's asylum and refugee programs, including who is eligible to make a refugee claim. The federal government's failed policies at the border in Quebec have allowed people to enter this country illegally and then seek asylum without following the pro proper processes. This government, the Ford government, has called on the federal government to actively manage the influx of illegal border crossers and to provide full compensation to the province of Ontario at the tune of $200 million, and those concerns and those questions have gone unanswered. There has been no indication that the federal government has a plan to deal with this, and there has been no indication that the federal government will pay for it. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her detailed answer. I understand the cost Ontario faces. The minister has been perfectly clear in this House, some would say crystal clear, with the Federal Ad Hoc Committee on, Mi on Migration, with the Minister of Immigration on the $200 million that's owed to Ontario. Mr. Speaker, the stack of bills is mounting. The Ministry for Children, Community and Social Services still needs to pay for its priorities. Programs for autistic children, funding for the Children's Aid Society, youth and care, custody, and so much more. Does the minister believe that the costs for illegal border crossings are increasing, and in light of the state of the deficit and the results from the line-by-line -line audit, do these escalating costs concern the minister? Minister. Speaker, that was a, a very important question. I'll have more to say on some of the uh, extensive costs that we're starting to see as a result of kids going back to school in September, but let me be clear. The federal government should be compensating Ontario for $74 million and growing in temporary housing in the City of Toronto, $11 million and growing in the City of Ottawa for temporary shelters, $3 million has been given to the Red Cross, $20 million for primary and secondary education sp uh, spaces, and $90 million and growing on the social assistance rates. And my, my, our government is isn't the only ones that are concerned. There's a new government elected in Quebec that is in line with where we're at in telling the federal government that they have to pay their bills. And we also have all premiers across this great country that have lined up shoulder to shoulder with our premier in saying that the federal government should fully compensate the cost yeah. of the province. And that's not it. We also have a Spons. federal Liberal MP that says the only fair thing for everybody to do is process them click quickly. And I think that's where the government's weakness is. That's John McKay, a federal Liberal Start the clock. Member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. It's now October, and students have been taught an archaic curriculum for one month now, a curriculum that does not address the current realities that Ontario students are facing. 
Teachers, students, concerned parents, to name a few, have literally stood on the lawns of Queen's Park speaking out against this sex ed curriculum rollback. But it is painfully clear that this government has not been listening to them. And then last Friday, the government quietly released a predetermined form online that appears to be this government's version of the largest consultation in Ontario's history. And then the minister said the government will only be promoting the consultations within their regions. So which is it? Will we be seeing consultations in every riding in the province, or will the government only be picking and choosing which voices they feel like hearing? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I can tell you, we are very assertively addressing the archaic math curriculum that's out yeah, there. Wow, the we math. heard loud the and clear math. that from parents that the math was not cutting it. And our consultation is going to be very comprehensive, starting off with hearing from parents, hearing from teachers, hearing from businesses, how we can be better equip our students to be competitive in today's global economy. I can tell you the, mem the people attending, our guests today in the members' gallery, will be applauding us for taking a look at STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That's everything that the agri-food and the business of food in particular need to be competitive in today's global economy. Response? We are moving forward, and I invite every single member in this House yeah, yeah. to participate and read your mail. You received information on Friday. Order. Order. <laughs> Order. Start the clock. Supplementary about this on Friday, Mr. Speaker, were actually the, the school boards, right? Yes. The public didn't find out anything. No. But, Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister of Education. That was an incredible non-answer. I suspect that perhaps she's feeling a little ashamed looking up at all of these students who are here today who had a real answer about the sex ed curriculum. Education consultations do not mean much unless those most impacted are invited to the table, Minister. Students and teachers must be consulted. Indigenous youth must be consulted. Queer and trans youth, differently abled youth, they must be consulted. And the list goes on. It is irresponsible of this government to make decisions without listening to those who are Speaker. going to be the most Speaker. impacted. Mr. Speaker, why is this government trying to handpick who will be involved in the sex ed consultations? And what are you so very afraid of hearing? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I would suggest to everyone in the House today watching, this is a lesson in not what to do. This is a lesson on how not to stand up and be poor opposition. We need to have an opposition that stands with us. I invite the member from Davenport to stand with us and actually go back because she was absolutely incorrect in saying that the members have not received information. I can confirm 100 per cent that everybody received information about this consultation yeah, yeah, on yeah, Friday. Yeah. We're very proud to be Perfect embarking Davenport. on Davenport. an initiative that's going to invite business, to invite everyone. parents, teachers, everyone. sports, Perfect trustees, Davenport, every on. single person who wants Fonts. to exercise their voice about yeah. STEM, everybody. about job skills, yeah. about Financial mental health, Financial about Financial health and physical education. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Flamborough, Flanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, when I listened to your speech on the findings of the Independent Financial Commission of Inquiry, like most Ontarians, I was truly shocked to hear the reality of the province's financial situation. Clearly, our government needs to take action. Not only do we need to fix the financial problems that we have inherited from the previous government, 
but we must also determine how the situation was ever allowed to get this bad. That's why I am encouraged that the motion to form a select committee on financial transparency was passed this morning. Could the minister please reiterate the importance of the select committee on financial transparency that is being formed? Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Flamborough Gran uh, Glanbrook. This morning, we took the next step in restoring accountability and trust in government. The formation of the Select Committee on Financial Transparency solidifies our government's commitment to restoring the public's faith. We must remember we are in unprecedented time in history. The public's trust has been shattered. The previous government's accounting scheme was deliberately designed to keep the true cost of the Liberals' spending off the books. This is simply unacceptable. The Select Committee on Financial Trans uh, Transparency is a necessity. They will find, up, speaker, find out speaker, who came up with this scheme. Where's the money? Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the minister. You know, I am really encouraged that we are taking action to restore accountability and trust. And I'm confident that the Select Committee on Financial Transparency will discover where these schemes came from and hold those responsible to account. Here, here. Yeah. However, over the past week, many of our critics have claimed that the Select Committee isn't necessary. The naysayers and critics have shrugged off its importance. But there is a larger principle at play here and that is accountability. It's unfortunate some people simply don't recognize the importance of seeking accountability. Could the minister please inform the House why restoring accountability and trust is so important for our government? Here, here. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member. The importance of restoring accountability and trust cannot be understated. Remember, it was the Auditor General who used words, and I'm going to quote her, like conceal, yeah. bogus, deceptive, and unreliable. She used those words to describe liberal documents tabled right here in this legislature. The Auditor General also issued this warning to the people of Ontario. Again, I quote, when governments pass legislation to make their own accounting rules that serve to obfuscate the impact of their financial decision, their financial statements become unreliable. That is why accountability and trust need to be restored. It was absent Spons. in the previous government, Speaker. We can calculate the cost of the deficit, but we cannot calculate the cost of the trust deficit. Start the clock. Member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is for the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. This government recently made a decision to ignore the concerns of both investors, investment regulators, and seniors advocate groups, such as the Canadian Association of Retired Persons, who called for the banning of deferred, deferred sales charges on mutual funds. Mr. Speaker, people across our province struggle to save and put a little money aside for their retirement, and these deferred charges are an unnecessary and extra burden on these people. So why is this government ignoring the voices of seniors and people who are saving for their retirement? Minister responsible for seniors and accessibility. Thank you for the question. I'd like to refer the question to the Minister of Finance. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, our government is absolutely committed to making Ontario a competitive place, a place that we can invest in, grow, and create jobs. And we want the world, Speaker, to know that Ontario is open for business. We will continue to work with other provinces, other territories, and other stakeholders to explore potential alternatives outside of the measures of the Ontario Security Commission. 
that what they are proposing is one thing. We will continue to work with our partners to look for other proposals. Uh, we want the market, Speaker, to be a fair place Fonts. for investors. Thank you. Complimentary. So, Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Mr. Speaker, if this government won't listen to our own seniors and groups like CARP, who say that deferred sales charges mean Ontarians will not be able to say, invest or fund their retirements effectively. Will they listen to investment regulators such as the Canadian Securities Commission and the Ontario Securities Commission who study these charges and they have long described these fees as bad for investors? Or is this really about making conservative lobbyists happy? Response, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, but I won't thank the member for the insult to uh, to our party whatsoever. I, I do find those types of comments are not helpful uh, in this legislature. <clears throat> She's not only impugning motive; she doesn't have her facts right, Speaker. The, the member should understand what the deferred commissions, uh, the embedded commissions, were all about. She may want to study what happened in the UK with embedded commissions and how this uh, did not work. Speaker, she may she may need to uh, uh, do a little bit of studying of other embedded commissions and the the damage that it caused elsewhere throughout the world, and begin to understand that we're trying to consult with the other provinces, the other territories, and other stakeholders to make sure that our marketplace is a, a fair place Spons. for investors. Speaker, we've got the people, uh, of all of the people in mind as we continue to look for a better, a better way. Thank you. Next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Uh, speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, Ontario's dedicated correctional officers and staff have faced a significant amount of work-related stress due to the previous Liberal government's neglect and their failure to act in providing these men and women with the tools they need to perform their duties safely and effectively. After 15 years of mismanagement by the previous Liberal government, our dedicated correctional officers and staff were ignored for too long. Speaker, the safety of our hardworking and dedicated correctional officers can no, no longer be ignored. To the minister, can you please update the members of this legislature on what you are doing to enhance security and improve safety in Ontario's correctional system? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for Scarborough Agent Court for the question. Mr. Speaker, this past Friday, I was proud to stand alongside the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry and the member from Chatham-Kent Leamington to announce our government's new plan to enhance safety and security at Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre. Mr. Speaker, as the member stated, the previous Liberal government failed to act and left our correctional officers and staff in harm's way for over 15 years. Prior to this announcement, I visited the City of London and heard firsthand the challenges that frontline officers and staff are encountering at Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre, as well as the challenges being faced by police and community members in the city. Response. Our government is listening and remains committed to providing our hardworking and dedicated correctional officers and staff the necessary tools and resources they need to do their jobs properly. Here, here, right. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I want to thank the Minister for his response. I am proud to stand here today knowing that our government for the people is taking the safety and the security of our correctional officers and staff seriously. Speaker, our hardworking and dedicated correctional staff deserve better after 15 long years of mismanagement and neglect by the previous Liberal government. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions he is taking to address the safety of our neighborhoods and security of the province's hardworking and dedicated correctional officers and the staff? Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for that question. In response to the recent inmate overdoses at Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre, our government introduced enhanced safety and security measures to ensure that our correctional officers and staff can perform their duties safely and effectively. Mr. Speaker, as of yesterday, staff at EMDC will have access to a dedicated K-9 unit, additional correctional officers, enhanced body scanner training, and new drug detection kits to quickly identify whether a found substance is contraband. In addition, Mr. Speaker, our government is piloting a dedicated hospital escort team for inmate health care needs. Our government also plans on hiring more health care staff to support inmate care, enhancing staff training to recognize the signs of potential overdoses, and piloting an ion scanner that can identify trace elements of drugs on items that enter our facilities. Mr. Speaker, we are using evidence-based Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Now that John Tavares is on the Leafs roster, we all know. Thank you. We all know. We all know there will be a Stanley Cup parade here in Toronto next year. You heard it here first. But, but, there is a but, after reading ongoing investigative reports that have shocked sports and music fans, not only in Canada, but the United States as well, it's clear that most hockey fans, in my riding, won't be able to afford Maple Leaf tickets. This is because of unethical ticket scalping practices that have been not only tolerated, but enabled by Ticketmaster. What is the minister doing about these unethical and unfair sales practices? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Well, thanks, uh, thanks very much to the member opposite for the question. Finally, we found something that we can agree on with the NDP, and that is that the Leafs are going to win the Stanley Cup this year. I couldn't be happier. I couldn't be happier that uh, John Tavares is a member of the Buds here in Toronto this year as yeah, yeah. we commence on our Stanley Cup parade. I can tell you that what was happening previously with the Liberal government on the ticket sale issue wasn't actually helping those who wanted to attend sporting events and concerts and uh, other big events that were happening. Uh, this first came to light, actually, Mr. Speaker, when uh, the unfortunate diagnosis of Gord Downey of the tragically hip uh, right. uh, occurred, and the government made some changes to the Ticket Speculation Act uh, during that summer. I can tell you that our government is committed to working with the Minister of the Attorney General, our, our Attorney General here uh, in Ontario, and making sure that we bring in some legislation that has some teeth so we can keep ticket prices low for those who want to attend these events. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary. One of, the very, one of the very first things this government did when it assumed office was to block legislation that would have stopped scalpers from selling tickets for more than 50 percent of the face value. Yeah. I don't remember the Premier telling anyone before the election he would do this. Why was it suddenly the government's top priority after the election to help Ticketmaster and the scalpers while hurting music fans and hockey fans? <laughs> Minister. Speaker, uh, I, I should acknowledge as well that uh, this is the first question uh, from my critic, and I appreciate uh, the question in the legislature here uh, this morning. But, but I should say that um, you know what the Liberals used to do when they were the government of Ontario was they would bring in pieces of legislation that actually were just all about fluff. They made you feel like the government was actually doing something when Opposition clearly the legislation didn't do anything to attack the problem at hand, and that was ensuring that ticket prices remained affordable for the average person across the province. What we've done is we've paused the implementation until we can actually bring in legislation that's going to take these scalpers off the streets, that's going to take these scalpers offline. It's not just simply putting it down on a piece of paper Bonds. that you're going to bring in legislation. Legislation. You know, you actually have to have legislation that's enforceable. We're bringing in meaningful legislation yeah, yeah. for the people of Ontario. Yeah, yeah.
order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Niagara West. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, this past Monday, the, the Minister for Tourism, Culture and Sport visited the Niagara region and, and engaged with stakeholders on red tape reduction in tourism. The wine, culinary and agritourism industries are a growing and key component of tourism in Ontario, adding good jobs to our economy, especially in the Niagara region I'm proud to call home. So could the minister please explain to the House what steps our Premier and government are taking to making sure that Niagara and Ontario is finally open for business? Yeah. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you for the question, and thank you for uh, participating in the roundtable yesterday. It was very valuable because there is no doubt that our Niagara region is a success story. We have some incredible businesses that are doing great work, but we need to do better as a government. And part of the roundtable's goal was to listen to those stakeholders, listen to those agribusinesses, listen to those tourism operators, and find out where the regulations are in the red tape that are blocking their ability to expand. We want to make sure that Ontario is open for business, and yesterday was a first good step towards that goal. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I know that both job creators in my riding were very pleased to see the minister down in Niagara, and they're pleased that steps are being taken by our government to address the unfair regulatory burdens that have been plaguing tourism and business in Niagara for far too long. Here, here. I'm confident in our government and our premier to make it easier for businesses to thrive and succeed in the Niagara region, something that the former Liberal government failed to do. Could the minister please elaborate to the House on what is being done to attract tourism and increase business to both Niagara and Ontario as a whole? Minister. Now, yesterday's roundtable, as you know, um, really showed how we need to work together. We have impacts and, and regulations that, that all of our caucus and cabinet colleagues have to deal with, whether it's municipal affairs and housing, whether it's infrastructure, finance. Um, all of us need to work together to make sure that the regulations that are, are in place are protecting our people and our business, but also that the regulations make sense. And it was, it was enlightening and very helpful to have those stakeholders share very specific examples of how we can do better, and I can assure the member that with his help and with our, our government open for business, we will do that. Thank you. Next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker, Sunrise Place Nonprofit Housing Co-op is a vibrant 58-unit seniors building in my riding. Sunrise has to replace their makeup air unit, which brings in fresh air from outside. It would improve air quality and reduce energy. The cost of replacement is $105,000. Sunrise applied for the Green on social housing grant and was successful. Unfortunately, as of July 9th, this grant has now been cancelled and with it the money for Sunrise. Does this government want seniors in Oshawa to be able to breathe easily, and will this government reinstate the grant to cover the cost of the air quality unit? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, and I, I appreciate the question. Uh, as I've said before in this, uh, in this legislature, uh, when our government was elected on the basis of getting rid of the cap-and-trade program, responsibly we also needed to wind down the uh, program, the, pro the costs of the various items that were being paid for by that program. And so very early we announced to transfer partners that we would be doing that. It's being wound down in a very orderly fashion. Uh, we're working with the various uh, organizations that were transfer partners. In some cases, because the contracts have been signed, programs are going forward. In the cases where they're not, the responsible thing, because the program has been ended, is not to, uh, not to proceed with that program. Um, this is because we believe that affordability is a critical issue. We believe that putting $260 back in the pockets of every family is an important item. We believe that reducing gas prices and natural gas prices Spons. are the priority, and, uh, and that is the approach we've taken. Supplementary. Thank you. And again to the Minister, one of the Premier's first priorities was to cancel support for green initiatives, improvements and repairs across our communities. This government cancelled the Green on Social Housing Grant, and so now Sunrise Place Seniors Co-op 
has had to cancel their plans to install this necessary air quality unit. This government cut this grant and seems proud of that decision, but our seniors need to live in healthful environments. Sunrise reached out directly to the Premier's office and has heard nothing back, so I'll ask the minister today for them. Will this government work with Sunrise to ensure they can move ahead with their building improvement plans? Minister. Again, through, through you to the member. Uh, with the end of cap and trade also came the end of that program. This is a government that is enormously sensitive to seniors and to all, all of our uh, citizens in the Durham region. That's one of the reasons that we did not proceed with the NDP's plan to close the Pickering nuclear power plant, which would have affected 7,000 people. So, Mr. Speaker, this, 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 the people of Ontario can count on this government to respect seniors, to respect all taxpayers, um, to behave responsibly with our finances, and obviously to balance the needs of a healthy environment as well. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the time we have this morning for question period. I want to recognize the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Point of order. I want to introduce to you and through you to members of the Legislative Assembly a very special guest in the public gallery, my daughter, Caitlin Clark. Once again, the minister. Speaker, I, I also have uh, another introduction uh, today. Uh, uh, we have the father of uh, Page Captain uh, Victoria McLeod Varner in the public gallery. I know her mother gets lots of uh, opportunities to speak, but I wanted to introduce her father, Joe Varner. Welcome to Queen's Park. This house stands in recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.